On August 10th, 2008, Martha Bowman and her two young sons got home around 1.30 to find their front door slightly ajar. Then they made a horrifying discovery. 911, what's the problem? I don't know. We're just walking in the house and they just mess everywhere. Is anyone injured? My husband. My brother went in the room and that's when he started yelling, Dad. I tried to steal his name and help, but he didn't wake up. So our victim is Paul Bowman, father of two, 50 years old, when he was beaten to death while he slept in his own bed. Mm -hmm. Paul Bowman was married to a lady named Martha. They had two sons together. Paul was so excited to finally have his own children. He was all involved in his son's baseball, cared about the boys. Very devoted father. Mm -hmm. Why would this happen to him? Paul's two sons meant everything to him. He was very involved in their life, truly a father that lived for his children. Paul seemed like he was really well liked by all his friends. His family adored him. All Paul ever wanted was to raise his sons and somebody robbed him of that. Our challenge is gonna be to figure out who could have done this and why. I think the problem is they just couldn't get anybody to break back then. So maybe we can get somebody else to talk. Yeah. We got our work cut out for us again. It has been 16 years and still no man. Police consider her killing a cold Years case. later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. This is a big PD, girly. I know. I bet you're Byron. I am. I'm Kelly. Nice to meet Kelly, you. Kelly, nice to meet you. Yolanda. Yolanda, nice, nice to, to meet you. you. I'm glad you guys are here in Arlington. We're a fairly big city here. Yeah. So. How many of you guys work for your department? We have probably 600 plus officers now. Yeah. How long have you been a cop? For 23 years now. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Show us our room. Okay. Oh, well, it's this way. Work. All right. This is a very difficult case, so I, I was very excited to have Kelly and Yolanda look at this case. My ego is never bigger than the case. Hey. Hey, Ellen. Hey. Girls. Yolanda and I have invited Alan Brown back to work with Byron because Alan's from Texas. Byron, I'm just going to shake your hand. I'm Byron. <laughs> <laughs> and why wouldn't you invite a Texas cop to work with some other guys from here? It'd be kind of silly not to. Why don't you start out by telling us about the victim? Um, the victim, Paul David Bowman. Uh, at the time of the offense, he was 50 years old. They lived in South Arlington. He works at a bank in Dallas, the midnight shift. And from all indications of people we talked to, he's an excellent father. And he was a part-time little league coach with his sons. And he was really proud of those boys as far as being active in their lives. Look at that. We could not find a person that would say anything negative about him at all. He, he was a good man. Walk us through the beginning of the case. On August 10th, he works at midnight shift. Paul came home around 8.30 or so, went upstairs, he used a computer. Around 9.12, he stopped on the computer and went into the master bedroom with the intention of going to bed. The boys were not at home at this time. They had spent the night with a friend. Martha said she left the house around 9.30 to 9.40 at the latest. She went to a friend's house. At some point, she left, went to go pick up the two boys, and then came back home. It was around 1.30 or so. When she got home, she realized that the front door was slightly ajar. And at some point, she went to the master bedroom where she saw him. And Paul 911. The on-call detective got the call, which was uh, Detective Lenore. Paul was found in the bed. It looks like he was just asleep in the bed. But when you take a closer look, the termination of his uh, death was blunt force trauma. At some point, Detective Tom Lenore made the determination to talk to Martha here at the PD. Do you remember if you locked front door that day? I did not lock it. Lenore interviews Martha six times. At least six times, yeah. 
First of all, have you heard anything new that I need to know? She gives timelines and things of that nature. How much time do you got before me today? But her story was not consistent. Why did you leave that door open? Does it? I locked the door. And you locked the door? Yes, and also... Time the... out, time out. You locked the door? Yes. Okay, on our suspect board, who y'all want to do first? Martha Bowman. What y'all want to start with? Unhappy marriage. She wants out of this marriage. Wanted out? There's multiple people that Say she that, said that. that. She was wanting out of the marriage. Paul made it clear that he wasn't going to grant the divorce. He didn't want his boys growing up in a broken home. She admits to Lenore they were fighting that morning and arguing. That's a good one. What else like that? He's having an affair. With Pedro. Yep. Prior to the offense, there were phone calls that Martha and Pedro had. You can tell that there's some type of relationship that they have that is not of the norm of a married woman. I'm going to ask you a very personal question. Are you in a relationship with him? No. No? Mm -mm. Zero? Mm -hmm. I can't stand people even when they're busted, they won't admit it. But the big lie is she was with Carmina. When Martha initially talked to the detectives, she told them that she left Paul asleep at home and she picked up her friend Carmina to go to a bakery. What did you have to go get? Uh, bread. Because, uh, uh... Oh, bread? Yes. Video surveillance confirmed that Martha was at the bakery that morning, but not with Carmina. She was there with her lover, Pedro. She never mentions payroll ever. Yeah. But could it be that she's just trying to hide Pedro over the affair issue so that she won't look like the number one suspect? It's because you're having an affair doesn't make you a murder. Y'all want to start working on Pedro? We got to think of the things that tell us that he's involved. He was with her that day, that morning. Yes. And they've been having this affair for how long would y'all guess? At least two years. Right when the murder happened, he did go to Mexico for a whole month. And then he comes home, the polygraph happens. Yes. What happened with him on the polygraph? It's deceptive. Yeah. Does anything about the crime scene make you think it's him? The Emmys report is it's a non-yielding blow. You're saying with the force that was used? It was it great force. There weren't many blows to Paul's head, but the few strikes that he did sustain were powerful enough to kill him. Skull is cracked. And it's not easy to do that. Killing Paul required a lot of force from the suspect swinging the weapon, and possibly even the weight of the weapon itself. Investigators discovered a tire iron outside of the home that could possibly fit. That tire iron has been sent to Sorsen. OK, so we're waiting so, on yeah, that. Yeah, we're waiting on that as well. OK, all right, got it. The tire iron has been sent to the lab for testing, and if it comes back with a DNA match and traces of our victim's blood, it could help figure out once and for all who killed Paul Bowman. The dad's name is Paul Bowman Sr., huh? Yes. And the sister Donna's going to be there? Yeah, she should be there as well. Okay. Of course, you know, the mother passed away here. So sad. Yeah. Did she know you were firing up the case again? Yeah, they told her just before she passed away what was going on. We are going to meet Paul's family today. They have also just very recently lost their mom. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. Mr. Bowman, how are you, sir? I just really hope that we're able to give them some hope here. Mr. Bowman, how are you, sir? Okay. I'm so sorry about your wife. Oh, I know it. So nice. She went so peacefully. Yeah. This made her <laughs> go that much more peaceful because she loved y'all's show. My mother used to sit up at night and watch Kelly and Yolanda on TV. And uh, we'd look at each other and go, wouldn't it be wonderful if they took on my brother's case? And it was the best gift they could have given my mother before she passed away. Talk about Paul. Best brother in the whole wide world. He was not only tall in stature, his heart was as big as he was. He was as good a son as a father could ask for. He loved sports. He was into sports. Yes. He played the band. He wrote a play. Wanted to be a comedian. He thought he was the funniest person on earth. What's the picture when he's got on like the gold looking shorts? <gasps> those oh, are he, my, those are those the twins. Are my, those are twins. my boys. Well, <laughs> yeah, he put on that outfit and then picked up the twins. So we had to snap a shot, of course. He didn't have children till later on in life. And he loved his kids dearly. He just loved them. And if your mom was sitting here, if your wife was sitting here, what would she tell us about him? That he was the best son that any mother would want. And he didn't deserve what he got. 
We are so sorrowful about it. It happened to our son. It was hard. It was very hard. I miss him so much, it's hard to explain. Well, let me just tell you this. This man has done a fantastic job. Well, we know him and Tom both has been working there. Yes. yes. They've you done know, a great day job. Day and night. And we need to, need to fine tune it. And hopefully, with you guys' help, then we can do that. You know? But you know, we can't promise you anything. Right. right. You know. right. I'm just hoping for justice. And now with, with Yolanda and Kelly coming in, it's just like new hope. We're headed to the crime scene, Paul Bowman's home, that he lived in with his wife and two sons at the time of the murder. Martha and the boys moved out shortly after. We talked to the homeowners, and they let us just go back over the crime scene to kind of get a feel for what happened. When police initially arrived at the scene, they had to consider robbery as a possible motive for Paul's murder. And the one thing that didn't make sense to me uh, in that bathroom was his wallet with money. The dresser drawers were pulled out, but there's a camcorder on that dresser. Other valuable items on that dresser that you'd think a burglar would take, none of that stuff is disturbed. There was no forced entry into this residence, and there was nothing taken from the residence. So it was apparent that this was not a robbery. It just doesn't make any sense that this would be a burglary that had gone bad. This suspect entered the bedroom with one goal, to kill Paul. investigating the scene where in 2008 Paul Bowman's wife and sons shockingly found him beaten to death in his bed this is pretty identical to the way it was he was laying on this side of the bed no he was actually right yeah, here right in the middle right in the section. middle based on the autopsy report Paul's body position and the lack of defensive wounds police believe that he was murdered in his sleep around 9 30 a.m. I mean really his head is tucked into this pillow this is about all the area that you have Paul sustained several blows to the head, causing his skull to crack, likely leaving him unconscious and incapacitated. Brain swelling and internal bleeding then caused his skull fracture to become fatal. We have a little bit of spatter coming up onto the pillow right in front of him, and a little tiny piece of his ear is missing. Now, we know that back here on this wall, you wouldn't be surprised if that's that little piece of ear. Mm -hmm. And then on the back right here, he's got what looks like a circle bruise. Do y'all think that this strike could be from a bat? Swing a bat pretty hard, it does a lot of damage. Since Paul was a coach with the uh, baseball team that his sons played on, there were several bats around the house, and we had them all tested. We did not find any definitive evidence that suggests any of those bats were used against Paul. Now, we know we do have that tire iron out there that was on the back patio on the grill. While we don't know what weapon was used, we can deduce from Paul's injuries how the murder occurred. For demonstration purposes, we brought along a tire iron similar to the one that we sent to the lab for testing. If the person was walking in, he's facing the door, you have to probably stand a little bit closer to the bed. You can come straight down. The person came up pretty high again for the mm -hmm. second one. You can go down again. And then you have that third blow that we believe is just separate, and it goes straight down as well. Man, this is heavy. If I was a girl hitting with one thing, I yeah. can't I can't hold it tight enough. Because y'all know a girl's wrist is just not as strong as a man's is. Yeah. Not to be sexist or anything, but as a guy, I would just go down like this. As a guy, you probably yeah. would. I could not, even with two hands, get the kind of torque I know I need to inflict the injury. Because I don't want him waking up. Oh, right? God, no. On the first blow, you don't want to mess it up. So, so. I'm going to swing as hard as I can downward. But a girl a can't. Byron's walking through this murder as if a man did it, which is possible, but not the only possibility. You're holding like a girl, but you're not swinging like a girl. Watch <laughs> this. If a woman wielded a weapon with two hands, she'd likely need a wider range of motion to build up enough momentum to exert a deadly force. But seeing how big this room is, that's entirely possible. So if I'm mad, I still know how to swing. Mm -hmm. You're going to go like this. Cow! Like that. I mean, you can still swing mm -hmm. way back here, and you're like that you don't yeah. have to go like this yeah. okay. if you can rear back and swing hard enough you can kill somebody that way you don't have to be big and six foot tall to do that 
So you good with everything, Byron? Yeah, and you have more room here to just go back and swing, so I, I, right. I can see that a lot clearer now. Seeing firsthand the bedroom's layout and the space that Paul's killer had to maneuver, it's clear that both Martha, Paul's wife, and her lover, Pedro, would have been physically capable of killing Paul. We need to talk to the Bowman's neighbors to see what they remember from that day. Hey, I'm Byron Stewart. After discovering Paul's body, Martha and the two boys called over James Williams and his girlfriend, Jeanette Hunt, for help. You remember that case, the Paul Bowman case? Call him Pete. You call him Pete? Yeah, he's a good neighbor. We got ready to go outside. You know, we were going to go to Fort Worth to get some tacos. Mm -hmm. And then she and the boys were outside. And then, yeah, she told us to come here. So when I walked in, I stood stood back and I said, Pete, he didn't say nothing. So you walk into the bedroom? Could you see his head? It looked like you could see like a little blood. And so I just came out and I said, yeah, I didn't call somebody. Was she, like, tearfully crying at that no. point? She didn't start to crying and the wailing and stuff until she was inside my house and the, and that, uh, the uh, baseball coach's wife asked her what happened. Mm -hmm. She just started saying, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. And, ah, oh, just really carrying on it like she didn't want to answer. So was it your interpretation that her wailing and crying and carrying on all of a sudden was to avoid answering that question the woman had I asked absolutely her? believe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I sure do. Yeah. Also, she was saying something that she wanted some alcohol. So I'm thinking maybe she might want a beer or some wine. Uh -huh. But she wanted, for some reason, she wanted a rubbing alcohol. She specifically asked for rubbing alcohol? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I went and got up rubbing alcohol, put some on the paper towel to get to it, and she was <laughs> like, no. And took the whole bottle and doused it on the arm and started rubbing her whole arm. Was it both arms? Just one. Mm hmm. There's no way of knowing how someone will react when they find a loved one murdered, but dousing yourself in rubbing alcohol is just odd. Could she have been trying to get rid of forensic evidence? What did you think when you saw that? I'm like, I wonder why I should do that. Strange. All right, guys, are we uh, ready to call Cammy from Sorensen and see if anything possibly was found on that tire iron? Because the tire iron is a possible murder weapon in this case, we had the police send it out for testing in the weeks before we came to town. Today, we're getting back the results. Hello, this is Cammie. Hey, Cammie, it's Yolanda. We're calling to talk to you about that tire iron. We did obtain the mixture, and there is a male profile. It looks like it's a mixture of maybe a male and a female. Tire iron recovered from the home of Paul Bowman has been tested by the lab and the results are in. We did obtain the mixture and there is a male profile. It looks like it's a mixture of maybe a male and a female. But it's unknown. This wasn't blood or tissue that you found. This is basically just no. a type of touch DNA. Yeah, they evaluated it before we did any swabbing for the presence of blood, and okay. there was nothing. Okay. Even though there's evidence that a male and female have touched this tire iron, there's two problems. One, the results are inconclusive. But more importantly, the lab didn't find any of Paul's blood on the tire iron. So there's no evidence that it's the murder weapon at all. All right, thank you, Cammie, so much for taking the time. Bye-bye. It's not blood. It doesn't matter. Anybody could have touched it. It could be mine. We need Paul's blood. Yeah, yeah or it doesn't matter. It was always a long shot, and now we know the tire iron doesn't help us at all, so now we need to just hit the streets. So this is Dana Harris? That's correct. Let's go see who's home. At the time the murder happened, the marriage between Paul and Martha had started to deteriorate. A lot of couples have unhappy marriages, but that doesn't mean they end in murder. So we need to talk to our witnesses to try and find out what was really going on in their relationship. Did you ever see anything out of the ordinary there at the house? We knew that they were having problems because we could hear them yelling at each other. Did the arguing occur on a regular basis? That seemed pretty frequent. Did it really? Yeah, I, honest, I really thought they would probably get divorced. 
because they didn't seem to be happy together any longer. But they would pass each other just as if they didn't see each other. What did Paul confide in you? Well, he had told me that he felt that he married her when she was pretty young, and he allowed her to go out to bars and, and hang with her girlfriends and stuff like that. He just wanted her to get it out of her system. Did there come a time where Paul thought maybe it was more than just clubs and fun and maybe a I serious person? So. I don't recall him ever saying that he caught her cheating, but he had suspicions. I no. think he was afraid that she was going to leave him and take the kids. I think that she was enraged by the fact that he would not let her take the boys. We heard later that everything that he owned was uh, thrown in the trash. Pictures. Kids don't have anything. She got rid of her yeah. wedding pictures. Everything in that house was destroyed. Talk about Paul. Did he ever confide in you problems that he was having with his wife at the time? Yes, sir. He had found out that she had somebody she was interested in. Mm -hmm. She was wanting a divorce. When this confrontation started, she said, well, I'm going to get the house and I'll get alimony and I'll get child support and I'll be just fine. And he was not going to give her anything. All I've ever heard from him was that he wanted to raise his boys the same way he was raised. Uh -huh. Both parents in home, that's what he wanted. He always said to me, I expect to be with her the rest of my life. All these people clearly established all the things going on in Paul and Martha's life. She was unhappy. They had almost gotten divorced. She was going out at night and partying and having an affair with Pedro. So there's a lot there to make you think, ooh, she had reason to be really desperate to get out of this marriage. And maybe she turned to the only shoulder that she probably had to cry on, which was Pedro. Let's cut to the chase. How long has he been having? A romantic affair. La amistad tuya con Marta. ¿Por cuánto tiempo ha sido romántico la amistad? No ha sido romántico, así que digamos. Pedro has always downplayed his relationship with Marta, so it's important for us to try and figure out how serious it really was. We're on the way over to see the ex-wife of Pedro. I talked to her about how she found out about him having the affair with Martha. And Hopefully she can remember it all. Yeah. Pedro was divorced at the time of this murder, but he was still involved with his ex-wife, Janet, while he was seeing Martha. How are you feeling this morning? <laughs> how did you find out that Pedro was having an affair? When your man don't come home for the milk, you know he's getting the milk somewhere else. OK. And I had to pull it out of him. He told me that the woman he was with was married, but she was getting a divorce because her and her husband fought all the time. I said, this girlfriend of yours, she have any kids? He said, yeah, she has two. I said, so you've seen a married woman with two kids? And he's like, well, I love her. I'm sorry. He called me and I said, I just got through talking to a detective. He goes, I know about this lady's husband. I said, yeah. Is he killed him? I said, did you kill him? He goes, no, I didn't kill him. I said, well, how can I believe you? You lied to me in my marriage for two years, so what's to keep you from lying to me now? <laughs> it sounds like Pedro was really in love with Martha. And it makes you wonder if he would have taken care of the only thing that stood in the way of that relationship. We still have two suspects, Martha Bowman and Pedro Reyes, in the 2008 murder of Paul Bowman, which tragically left two little boys without a daddy. You said that you were spending the night somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Where were you staying? At my brother's friend's house that he plays baseball with. Through the years, the boys have probably always wanted to cooperate. It's just they don't have anything new to add to the investigation. So your mom came and picked you and your brother up. Do you know what time she picked y'all up? No. We do, however, want to talk to Bob Ritter. Ritter, you're going to have a seat over here. Paul's sons had slept over the night before at Bob's house, and Martha went to pick them up that morning. 
Mm-hmm. I do so. remember that she was late, mm-hmm. like wickedly late. Mm-hmm. Right. You know. It was unusual for her to talk about church. Or I don't ever recall her previous to that. Explain that to me. We were busting her hump because she was late, you know, and it was mm-hmm. like, you were so late, what, you know, what church did you go to that it took you so long to get here? And she couldn't tell us the name of the church. She just kind of went, oh, you know, the one that you went to. It was just unusual. You, you, you were just there. You can't tell me the name of the dadgum church you were sitting in? Yeah. Come on. Martha initially claimed that she had spent the day at the bakery with Carmina. Yeah, how long did you stay at Carmina's? Till about 11.30. Till about 11.30? Yeah, and then I wouldn't give my kids. We know that was a lie because she was with Pedro. Now, according to Bob, Martha's claiming she was at church. Why does she keep changing her story? You recall anything that we've missed? The only thing that came to my recall was uh, the conversation that uh, one of the team members on my baseball team had with uh, Martha. Jose Andreas Batista. Mm-hmm. He, so he's a dad on my team. He recalled talking to Jose. Jose Bautista. Yes. He's still around, right? He's still around. Excellent. Bob Ritter heard this rumor that in the weeks before the murder, Martha had had this strange conversation with a man named Jose Bautista. Just do me a favor, Jose. Just have a seat over there, and I'll be with you right here in just a second, OK? Jose has talked to the police before, but we've called him in to make sure we get the story straight. This is about a case. Paul Bowman was the gentleman that was murdered. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I know him because he was a coach. Right. Coaching my, my son. When you were at baseball games then, you'd be in the stands, Martha would be in the stands, yeah. and that's how you got to, to know Martha was just there. But my wife, she don't like to be around her. Why? Because uh, mm-hmm. she always, on the baseball field, with those high heels this high, and she is walking on the concrete, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, make some. Mm-hmm. She's trying to dress looks, sexy? Yeah. What did she tell you about how she felt about her husband? She just tell me he's not a good husband with her because the way she, he treat her. She tell me, can you help me to find somebody mm-hmm. to just disappear this guy? What do you think she's meaning by saying that? When you say that word, that means... Disappear. That is disappear, yes. Vanish. Put three, Poof, three meters under the ground. And that's why I tell her, are you crazy? You have two sons, two kids. Mm-hmm. When they grow up and they ask her, where's my dad? What are you going to tell her? I tell them, I don't care. The importance of this cannot be stressed too much. If she solicited someone else to find somebody to kill her husband, that's an extraneous solicitation of capital murder. Right after she's asking you if you know somebody that can do that, next thing you know, he's dead. It happened that fast. Yeah, it's it's fast. When Jose refused to help Martha, she might have turned to the man closest to her, Pedro Rios. How far is that from here? It's not that far. And we don't even know if he's living there. The question is, would Pedro really kill for her? It's time for us to find out. There's a suburban there now. Maybe it's Pedro. That's what I'm hoping. All right, wish you luck. Pedro? Hi, Pedro. Steve Roswick, man. So, do you mind hopping in and let me talk to you real quick? Hi. Okay. In English? Espanol. Nosotros podemos hablar en en español, okay? Usted conoce una persona se llama Marta. Sí. En ahora, ahorita, usted y Marta son novias o... Sí o no? Estamos, sí, somos novios. Son novios. Y Martha no dice a usted sobre ella. Martha estaba tuvando problemas con Paul. Es posible, pero usted no recuerda. No, no, no sé, es que no sé realmente. Es que tú, tú me quieres decir que yo te estoy diciendo algo que yo no, no te puedo decir. No sé, mm. no entiendo. Yo, yo sé que ustedes sospechan de mí. Yo no haría eso. Porque no, 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 así yo... 
I don't know. Desde entonces yo no, no fui el mismo. ¿Sí me entiendes? Uh -huh. Nunca pregunta a Marta de qué pasó en la casa. No, yo nunca le he preguntado. ¿Por qué no? Y usted no creo que Marta puede hacer lo este, ¿sí? ¿Por qué? Dígame por qué. Es una buena madre. Y hasta ahorita con los otros lados no hay problemas. Dicen que... Una madre es diferente de una esposa. Pedro's frustration at still being at the center of this investigation really does seem sincere, but his vague memory about the details around that time still leaves us with some doubts. So when you look at the cell phone records, as far as Pedro's phone, and Martha's phone and where those two phones were located at the times that they made calls. Understanding a timeline is crucial in determining which of our two suspects, Martha Bowman or Pedro Rios, had the opportunity to kill Paul Bowman. We know that Paul was alive at 9.12 a.m. due to the login activity on his computer. And based on other evidence, police believe that Paul was murdered around 9.30 that morning. So we need to figure out where our suspects were around that time. If you look at Martha's records, Martha's phone makes a call at 9.55. And that's Already the gone. first call we had that morning yeah. showing yeah. us where Martha is. Yeah. Martha's always admitted that she left the house that morning. And at 9.55 a.m., her phone made a call to her nephew that pinged off of a cell tower approximately 2.75 miles from her house. So if Martha killed Paul, she had a 43-minute window to do that, get on the road and get out of there, which leaves her plenty of time. Prior to the offense that morning, Pedro's phone makes two calls. One's at 8.34 and the other's at 9.07. Both those calls are pinging off of a cell tower next to his house. So when does she first call Pedro? They do not talk to each other that morning at all. There's no call made where she would call around 9 o'clock and 9.20 to say, hey, he's asleep, come knock him out. Right. There's no call. If Pedro killed Paul, he probably wouldn't go to the house unless he's sure that Paul is already asleep. So there would have had to have been a call from Martha to Pedro telling him that. But we know from their phone records there was no call between the two of them that morning. I think that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. The cell phone information in this case is probably the most important piece because it's objective, it's verifiable, and it suggests Pedro was at his house the morning of the murder and never got a phone call to come and kill Paul. How do y'all feel about Pedro still being on the suspect board? Just from phone records alone, Pedro, he's just not in the timeline at all. It never puts him at the address at all. He's cleared by his phone records. You better believe it. What do you think, Steve? I don't think it was him. Ready to mark him off? I think he'd be marked. Ready him to off. mark him off? Yeah. Absolutely. Martha Bowman is the lone suspect left up on our board. And now it's time to confront her. This pillow right here. It's this one? Yeah. You hear me, Yolanda? Yep. Hey, I'm a Detective Stewart. I'm with Arlington PD, and i am uh, been assigned to work your husband's murder. Can we just sit in my car and talk about it? OK. You get on this side of the car here. Martha hasn't been spoken to since Byron took over the case. I'm wondering if she's going to change her story again. That day, you remember leaving the house around 9.30 or so? Mm -hmm. You went to a bakery. Did you go with Carmina? Did you go with Pedro? I went in his house, in his truck with Pedro. That at one point, you told him that it was Carmina that you went to the bakery with? Or? I was thinking that was her, but I remember uh, her car, it was uh, in the back. So his truck, it was uh, in, the, in the back. I mean, uh, so the, the truck only he can get out, it was his. Mm -hmm. So I told him, you can take me, and we can just buy the stuff and come back. Mm -hmm. What was y'all relation, you and Pedro's relationship at that time? That was my friend. Just a friend? Yeah. But y'all have a baby together now? Yeah. OK. Did you confide in him some of the problems that you were having with Paul? No. I don't have no problems with Paul. Mm hmm You didn't no, at that point? No, no. But if you talk to the next-door neighbor, they were constantly arguing, 
and arguing so loud that they could be heard in the house next door. Jose Bautista? Mm -hmm. You remember that name? You know that name? Mm -hmm. Mr. Bautista said that at one point before Paul was killed, mm -hmm. you wanted to try to find somebody who could uh, uh, do away with Paul or kill Paul or something like that or to that nature. Do you recall having the conversation no. one time? No. Did you talk to him at all? Do you, do you remember Mr. Bautista at all? I think I gotta remember the guy. No, I never talked to him at all. So you do remember him, right? Yes. Why would he say something like that? I don't know. It went from not knowing Jose Batista to, oh yeah, I remember Jose Batista. So she lies about things that would make her look like a suspect. You asked the lady for some alcohol, some rubbing alcohol. She took the whole bottle and doused it on the arm and started rubbing her whole arm. You remember doing that? Why would you take alcohol? This arm, this still sometimes hurt. Okay, okay. Uh, this, since there, I uh, have problems with my heart. Oh, your heart? Okay. Yes. Does rubbing alcohol help? Uh, yes. Can it stop the pain? Uh, not the pain, but it helps your arm feel like warm. Mm -hmm. And with the alcohol, it helps like fresh. Did the doctor tell you to do that or something? No, no I just because my mom, she had the same problem. Mm-hmm. Must be an old home remedy. Do you remember locking the door or leaving the door open? I locked the door. You locked the mm -hmm. door? No, you clear on that? Mm hmm It was damaged on the... It was damaged? Yes. You're saying the lock was damaged? Yes. Oh, good Lord. The detective and the crime scene people looked at the lock pretty closely. There's no evidence that the lock was defeated. There's no damage to the door. So what do you think? Do you think uh, I'll kill him? What am I going to do something like that with well, my kids? I had two kids with him. Well, I can be divorced, so why do I need to kill somebody to go? But isn't it true that Paul told you that if you if, if you left him, that he would have the house and he would keep the kids and you would leave with nothing? She told me, well, I'm not going to leave the kids with you and with another man. And he's like, you ass are going to be with me all your life. Martha just keeps continuing her pattern of lies and inconsistencies. This interview couldn't have gone any better. Okay, Byron and Steve, the PC is all typed up. We knocked out all your to-dos. We got the calls back from everybody and all the witnesses. What are y'all thinking? I think the case is pretty solid right now. I agree with them. I'm pretty confident about presenting the case to the DA's office. All right, will y'all go? Let us know as soon as you hear something back. We will. We'll, be waiting. we'll get back with you. We now believe that we have circumstantial evidence strong enough to ask the DA to seek an indictment against Martha Bowman for the murder of her husband, Paul. Martha has been deceptive since the beginning of this investigation. Me and Carmina went to the store. You weren't with Carmina. You were with him. No, yeah, but I mean, I went. And she continues to lie to this day. You're saying the lock was damaged? Yes. Oh, good Lord. Even after seven years, she is still suspiciously hiding her affair with Pedro. What was you and Pedro's relationship at that time? That was my friend. Just a friend? And she still doesn't want to admit she was unhappy in her marriage. We could hear them yelling at each other. I'm mean, I don't have no problems with Paul. Mm -hmm. You didn't yeah. at that point? Uh -huh. Martha wanted a divorce, but Paul would not grant her one because he didn't want his boys growing up in a broken home. He wanted to raise his boys the same way he was raised. Both parents in home, that's what he wanted. She was enraged by the fact that he would not let her take the boys. Finally, we have a witness who claims that just weeks before the murder, Martha tried to find a hitman to kill Paul. She tell me, do you know someone can help me to find somebody to just disappear, this guy? We just hope the DA agrees. What happened? Well, they like the case, the timeline and everything they like. They like the direction of the case and where it's going, but they have some additional work that they want us to do on the case. We're down the right road. OK. And y'all are never going to give up, so that's good. Yes. It was great working with y'all. Oh, thank you. The DA didn't give us a hard decision today, but he likes the case. He's excited about it, and we're very encouraged that it's going to move forward. One saying that we always say in homicide is that we speak for the dead. And Paul has a chance to have his voice heard, and the family has a chance to finally get some vindication of what happened to Paul. Well, 
I had a meeting with the DA's office, and they liked the case. They want the opportunity to review the entire case before they make the decision to go to the grand jury, but right. they really feel good about the case. A lot different than last right. time, so we are on the right track. Um, everything is looking good. Good. We're moving forward, so. We've been waiting to hear those words for so long. Yeah. My brother deserves some justice. If it would have been one of his siblings, he'd be fighting tooth and nail to find justice for us, and I know that. We can't thank you ladies enough for what all y'all done at Detective Stewart. Well, he, he's, he's also now fired up to start working on all of his other cold <laughs> cases, too. Well, thank you so much. You I excited? I'm so happy. I, I could almost cry, you know. But I'm trying not to. Your wife and your mom, you know, I think she would really be proud of uh, what's happening today. My mom, I know she's smiling down on us right now. I know she is. And my brother, he'll definitely always be there. Well, we're gonna let y'all get back home and talk about it all as a family and uh, wait for Byron's phone call. Thank y'all so, so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. You're the other family. <laughs> Thank you so much, oh. Kelly. Y'all are beautiful. Don't miss the mid-season finale of Cold Justice next Friday at 8 on TNT. On August 10th, 2008, Martha Bowman and her two young sons got home around 1.30 to find their front door slightly ajar. Then they made a horrifying discovery. 911, what's the problem? I don't know. We're just walking in the house and there's just mess everywhere. Is anyone injured? My husband. My brother went in the room and that's when he started yelling, Dad. I tried to just yell his name and I'm waiting to wake up. So our victim is Paul Bowman, father of two, 50 years old when he was beaten to death while he slept in his own bed. Mm -hmm. Paul Bowman was married to a lady named Martha. They had two sons together. Paul was so excited to finally have his own children. He was all involved in his son's baseball, cared about the boys. Very devoted father. Mm -hmm. Why would this happen to him? Paul's two sons meant everything to him. He was very involved in their life, truly a father that lived for his children. Paul seemed like he was really well liked by all his friends. His family adored him. All Paul ever wanted was to raise his sons, and somebody robbed him of that. Our challenge is going to be to figure out who could have done this and why. I think the problem is they just couldn't get anybody to break back then. So maybe we can get somebody else to talk. Yeah. We got to work cut out for us again. It has been 16 years and still no man. At least consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. This is a big PD, girly. I know. I bet you're Byron. I am. I'm Kelly. Nice to meet Kelly, you. Kelly, nice to meet you. Yolanda. Yolanda, nice, nice to meet, to meet you. you. I'm glad you guys are here in Arlington. We're a fairly big city here. Yeah. So. How many guys work for your department? We have probably 600 plus officers now. Yeah. How long have you been a cop? For 23 years now. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Show us our room. Okay. Oh, well, it's this way. Work. Right. This is a very difficult case. So I, I was very excited to have Kelly and Yolanda look at this case. My ego is never bigger than the case. Hey. Hey, hey. Ellen. Yolanda and I have invited Alan Brown back to work with Byron because Alan's from Texas. Byron, I'm just going to shake your hand. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> and why wouldn't you invite a Texas cop to work with some other guys from here? It'd be kind of silly not to. Why don't you start out by telling us about the victim? Um, the victim, Paul David Bowman. 
Uh, at the time of the offense, he was 50 years old. They lived in South Arlington. He works at a bank in Dallas, the midnight shift. And from all indications of people we talked to, he's an excellent father. And he was a part-time little league coach with his sons. And he was really proud of those boys as far as being active in their lives. Look at that. We could not find a person that would say anything negative about him at all. He, he was a good man. Walk us through the beginning of the case. On August 10th, he works the midnight shift. Paul came home around 8.30 or so, went upstairs, he used a computer. Around 9.12, he stopped on the computer and went into the master bedroom with the intention of going to bed. The boys were not at home at this time. They had spent the night with a friend. Martha said she left the house around 9.30 to 9.40 at the latest. She went to a friend's house. At some point, she left, went to go pick up the two boys, and then came back home. It was around 1.30 or so. When she got home, she realized that the front door was slightly ajar. And at some point, she went to the master bedroom where she saw him and called 911. The on-call detective got the call, which was uh, Detective Lenore. Paul was found in the bed. It looks like he was just asleep in the bed. But when you take a closer look, the termination of his uh, death was blunt force trauma. At some point, Detective Tom Lenore made the determination to talk to Martha here at the PD. Do you remember if you locked front door that day? I did not lock it. Lenore interviews Martha six times? At least six times, yeah. First of all, have you heard anything new that I need to know? She gives timelines and things of that nature. How much time do you got before me today? But her story was not consistent. Why did you leave that door open? I locked the, the door. And you locked the door? Yes, and also... Time the, out, time out. You locked the door? Yes. Okay, on our suspect board, who y'all want to do first? Martha Bowman. What y'all want to start with? Unhappy marriage. She wants out of this marriage. Wanted out? There's multiple people that Say she that, said that. that. She was wanting out of the marriage. Paul made it clear that he wasn't going to grant the divorce. He didn't want his boys growing up in a broken home. She admits to Lenore they were fighting that morning and arguing. That's a good one. What else like that? He's having an affair. With Pedro. Yep. Prior to the offense, there were phone calls that Martha and Pedro had. You can tell that there's some type of relationship that they have that is not of the norm of a married woman. I'm going to ask you a very personal question. Are you in a relationship with him? No. No. Mm -mm. Zero. Mm -hmm. Can't stand people even when they're busted, they won't even know. But the big lie is she was with Carmina. When Martha initially talked to the detectives, she told them that she left Paul asleep at home and she picked up her friend Carmina to go to a bakery. What'd you have to go get? Uh, bread. Cause, uh, uh... Oh, bread? Yes. Video surveillance confirmed that Martha was at the bakery that morning, but not with Carmina. She was there with her lover, Pedro. She never mentions Pedro ever. Yeah. But could it be that she's just trying to hide Pedro over the affair issue so that she won't look like the number one suspect? Just because you're having an affair doesn't make you a murder. Y'all want to start working on Pedro? We got to think of the things that tell us that he's involved. He was with her that day, that morning. Yes. And they've been having this affair for how long would y'all guess? At least two years. Right when the murder happened, he did go to Mexico for a whole month. And then he comes home and the polygraph happens. Yes. What happened with him on the polygraph? He's deceptive. Yeah. Does anything about the crime scene make you think it's him? The Emmys report is it's a non-yielding blow. You're saying with the force that was used? It was I mean, great force. There weren't many blows to Paul's head, but the few strikes that he did sustain were powerful enough to kill him. Skull is cracked. And it's not easy to do that. Killing Paul required a lot of force from the suspect swinging the weapon, and possibly even the weight of the weapon itself. Investigators discovered a tire iron outside of the home that could possibly fit. That tire iron has been sent to Sorsen. Okay, so we're waiting so, on that. Yeah, we're waiting on that as well. Okay, all right, got it. The tire iron has been sent to the lab for testing, and if it comes back with a DNA match and traces of our victim's blood, it could help figure out once and for all who killed Paul Bowman. The dad's name is Paul Bowman Sr., huh? Yes. 
And the sister Donna's going to be there? Yeah, she should be there as well. Okay. Of course, you know, the mother passed away here. So sad. Yeah. Did she know you were firing up the case again? Yeah, they told her just before she passed away what was going on. We are going to meet Paul's family today. They have also just very recently lost their mom. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. Mr. How are you, sir? I just really hope that we're able to give them some hope here. Mr. Bowman, how are you, sir? I'm so sorry about your wife. Oh, I know it. She went so peacefully. Yeah. This made her go that much more peaceful because she loved y'all's show. My mother used to sit up at night and watch Kelly and Yolanda on TV. And uh, we'd look at each other and go, wouldn't it be wonderful if they took on my brother's case? And it was the best gift they could have given my mother before she passed away. Talk about Paul. Best brother in the whole wide world. He was not only tall in stature, his heart was as big as he was. He was as good a son as a father could ask for. He loved sports. He was into sports. Yes. He played the band. He wrote a play. Wanted to be a comedian. He thought he was the funniest person on earth. What's the picture when he's got on like the gold looking shorts? <gasps> those oh, are my, those are those the are twins. My, those are twins. my boys. Well, <laughs> yeah, he put on that outfit and then picked up the twins, so we had to snap a shot, of course. He didn't have children till later on in life, and he loved his kids dearly. He just loved them. And if your mom was sitting here, if your wife was sitting here, what would she tell us about him? That he was the best son that any mother would want. And he didn't deserve what he got. We are so sorrowful about it. It happened to our son. It's hard. It was very hard. I miss him so much, it's hard to explain. Well, let me just tell you this. This man has done a fantastic job. We know him and Tom both has been working there. Yes. yes. They've you done know, a great day job. Day and night. And we need to, need to fine tune it. And hopefully with you guys' help, then we can do that, you know? But you know, we can't promise you anything. Right. You know. Right. I'm just hoping for justice. And now with, with Yolanda and Kelly coming in, it's just like new hope. We're headed to the crime scene, Paul Bowman's home, that he lived in with his wife and two sons at the time of the murder. Martha and the boys moved out shortly after. We talked to the homeowners and they let us just go back over the crime scene to kind of get a feel for what happened. When police initially arrived at the scene, they had to consider robbery as a possible motive for Paul's murder. And the one thing that didn't make sense to me uh, in that bathroom was his wallet with money. The dresser drawers were pulled out, but there's a camcorder on that dresser. Other valuable items on that dresser that you'd think a burglar would take, none of that stuff is disturbed. There was no forced entry into this residence, and there was nothing taken from the residence. So it was apparent that this was not a robbery. It just doesn't make any sense that this would be a burglary that had gone bad. This suspect entered the bedroom with one goal, to kill Paul. Reinvestigating the scene where in 2008, Paul Bowman's wife and sons shockingly found him beaten to death in his bed. This is pretty identical to the way it was. He was laying on this side of the bed. No, he was actually right yeah, here. Right in the middle. Right in the section. middle. Based on the autopsy report, Paul's body position, and the lack of defensive wounds, police believe that he was murdered in his sleep around 9.30 a.m. I mean, really, his head is tucked into this pillow. This is about all the area that you have. Paul sustained several blows.